you all for coming. If you didn't get one about upcoming programs, please do. Please sign up. So if you haven't signed up for next week for the second part of Religion and Myth, you can either do so online or stop at the reference desk on your way out. If you're not sure if you signed up, stop and chat. <laughs> if you have a cell phone, please turn it to vibrate or shut it off. I would also like to thank both the Friends of the Gleason Library and the Friends of the Council on Aging because they are the ones that pay for this program to happen in all of our cultural lectures and our health lecture. And um, we are very lucky to have Dr. Gianetti here. And for those that don't realize, beside his vast knowledge in religion, he is also an attorney. And he is an attorney of immigration. And so next year, instead of having him focus on religion, he's going to talk about immigration. So with that, I'll lead you to Dr. Gianetti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you to the Council on Aging. Thank you to the Friends of the Gleason Library. Thank you to all of you who are here in person. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, we have a two-part series on religion and myth. And I'm very pleased to be back at uh, the Carlisle Library, the Gleason Library, to be giving it. It feels like um, I'm here always at the perfect time of year, driving here through the roads uh, with all the leaves changing is just a delight. And uh, it's appropriate that we're talking about myth today on October 30th, the day before Halloween, which is a very mythical day of the year, I might say. Um, it's interesting because with almost every holiday, you can look at one of two things to see their origins, to see their mythic past, if you prefer. Um, and one of those things would be agriculture, and the other would be the turning of the seasons and the amount of light that we get. And usually those two things are very much linked up. And Halloween, as you may know, predates Christianity. The, the official uh, Christian idea of Halloween is that it is the eve before the All Saints Day, uh, which begins on November 1st, and in some traditions last three days, where the spirits of the past and the saints are to be honored. And on Halloween, there is a uh, coming out of those spirits from the, the ether. Um, but the holiday itself appears to predate Christianity uh, and seems to have a Gaelic origin, whereby there was a connection between the harvest festival, of course, we are harvesting things like pumpkins right now, especially here in New England, uh, apples and other fruits. Um, there's a harvest festival, so there's a reason to celebrate at that point. But there is also the change of seasons. Uh, we just passed the autumnal equinox. And so there is a balance between light and dark. I just got back from a trip to Seattle uh, two weekends ago. Uh, just before I went there, it was beautiful weather, sunny. And it's Seattle, it was sunny. It was really quite amazing for four <laughs> days. Then the day that I got there, it was rain and clouds. And the headline on the newspaper was, the big dark has rolled in. And apparently, <laughs> this is a thing in Seattle. They, they call it the big dark. And I apparently was the herald of it. And it was <laughs> raining and cold and cloudy the whole four days that I was there. Uh, but similarly, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, around this time of year, there is a, uh, a certain indication of the change of seasons. And it's, it's very perceptible when the sun begins to come up later and go down earlier. And so at this time of year, we are at a liminal point. And 
As you may already know, any liminal points, a point between one thing and another, is a point of both danger and a point of possibility. And so this time of year is when those spirits of the past, the spirits of the dead, can possibly slip from one realm to the other. And so we have a holiday to celebrate that, Halloween. Um, so it's appropriate that we're talking about myth today on October 30th. Um, and I also want to bring a different myth that uh, is one of our ancient past in Europe. It comes from the Greeks. Uh, and this is the myth of Hero and Leander. Now, Hero, we might think, uh, sounds like a masculine name, but it's actually the name of a woman for the Greeks. Uh, Hero was a woman who was in a tower that was on the Greek side of the Hellespont. That's where Asia and Europe meet. And Leander, her lover, was from uh, what we would now uh, in modern day call Turkey, uh, the uh, area that is connected with the Trojans for the ancient Greeks. And the story goes that Hero was in the top of the tower and that every night she would light a fire in the tower that looked out over the sea. And that Leander swam from his part, the uh, Asian part, if you will, to the Greek part in order to be with her. And he was guided by her light. And this worked fine all summer long. But then when we get to this liminal time of year, the time of year where winter is about to begin, things go awry. The waves get churned up by the winter storms. And as Leander is swimming across, he's uh, fighting with these big waves. And simultaneously in the tower, Hero is struggling to keep the fire lit because the winds are blowing it out. And eventually the winds prevail, they blow out the fire, Leander can no longer see his beacon, and he dies in the ocean, is washed up on the shore the next day, is found the next day by Hero, who then also uh, heartbroken, commit suicide. Now, that's a strange myth to begin with, but I want you to think about that myth. What other myths or stories is either contained in it or inspired by it that you can think of? Romeo and Juliet, two opposite sides. You have the Greeks and the Trojans. They are mortal enemies, and yet these two lovers uh, are star-crossed, fall in love. What else? Paul Revere. Paul Revere. Paul Revere, because of the lights in the... The light and the two sides. Okay, and the two sides, all right. I had not thought of that one. <laughs> Interesting. The, the China, uh, China painting is a man and a woman separated by water and one of them jumps in and drowns. Okay, I'm not sure that I'm familiar with that one, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> so let's think about some of the elements of this myth. You have a woman on the shore looking out over the ocean with a fire, a light for someone from a distant shore to be guided by on his journey there. Sound familiar? Well, it's Christian, isn't it? It's Christian. That's a little, that's a little over broad for me. The light of Christ. Oh, okay. The light of Christ? Possible. 
a fisherman. Well, this certainly would have a lot of relevance for fishermen who depend on the lighthouses, right? Statue of Liberty. A Statue of Liberty. Thank you very much. Think about that for a moment. All the way from probably maybe 2,500, 3,000 years ago, I'm not sure how old this myth of hero is, to the present day, the Statue of Liberty, a lady in the harbor with a beacon of light looking out over the water to those people coming from distant shores looking for safe harbor. So there's the Statue of Liberty. And think about what happens when that light goes out. Right? Leander is washed up on the shore dead. Leander coming from Asia. It gives me chills to think about because what is the Statue of Liberty a symbol of for us today? Freedom. Freedom, Freedom and? Liberty. Liberty and? Immigration. Immigration, right? Now, first of all, you see how I made that nice segue to <laughs> next year's talk? <laughs> um, but there's also a, one of the points that I wish to make with this story is that it's incredibly difficult to weed out myth. Myth is always alive. It just takes on different forms. Let's think about another modern example that could be connected to this story of Hero and Leander. How many of you are familiar with The Great Gatsby? Yeah. Ah. So in The Great Gatsby, Gatsby, who is on West Egg, is looking out over the ocean or the sound or the bay or whatever it is to East Egg, where <coughs> Daisy, his beloved, has a green light, a beacon of hope for Great Gatsby. Right? So these myths, they, they change form. But the underlying structure is still there. And that's the bigger point that I wish to make with mentioning this story is because today's lecture and, and next week's lecture is going to draw pretty heavily on one of my um, intellectual heroes, and that's Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, who famously uh, was interviewed in 88 uh, by Bill Moyers, uh, for the series called The Power of Myth. That's perhaps when I first uh, fell in love with myth, um, watching those, those uh, series on PBS. Uh, Bill Moore's, excuse me, uh, Joseph Campbell, who wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And in The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell talks about myth as being a, a constant that is garbed in the clothing of the place and time where it's being told. So he looks beyond all of the particulars of these different myths, and he tries to go back to see what is the underlying structure of these myths. What do they have in common, no matter where they come from, no matter what part of the world they come from, or what time period they come from. We can see certain structures that remain the same throughout them, but the, the dressing of the myth, the hero, the clothes that the hero wears, the masks, as Joseph Campbell might say, that the hero wears are different according to the place and time. So with that, let's start by talking about what is a myth? Right? In our day, in the 21st century, the word myth has a lot of negative baggage that is brought along with it. Oftentimes, it is meant to mean falsity. Right? I went to the Boston Science Museum, Boston Museum of Science, and 
in one of their areas, they had a sign up that says, truth or myth? <laughs> and it had all these different facts that you had to, or perhaps pseudo facts, that you had to press a button to see if it was true or if it was, quote, a myth. So what does a myth mean for us in that context? It means false. Well, I'm here to tell you that a myth is not a fact, but it's also not false. And what do I mean by that? That means we have to uncover what the meaning of myth is. And in trying to do that, one thing that I want to point out to you is, just like with the Statue of Liberty, that a myth is something so pervasive in the culture that you're not aware of it as a myth, right? Perhaps you've seen the Statue of Liberty a hundred times, and you thought, oh, there's the Statue of Liberty, right? You might have thought, oh, it's a symbol of liberty. Oh, it's a beacon of freedom, right? But you didn't think of it necessarily in the context of myth like you did this afternoon. And so a myth is something that we are not aware of as a myth. Or I might say, a myth is usually something that the culture, where it is a living myth, where the culture is not aware of it as a myth. But let's unpack what we mean by myth even further. And part of this bad reputation that myth has starts way, way, way back with the Greeks, right? Myth comes from a Greek word, muthos, and the use of the word muthos in Homer and Hesiod, the two great myth makers of the, uh, the ancient Greeks, the use of the word muthos was interchangeable for them with the word logos. Logos, from which we get the word logic and a log book, right? Or uh, all, all sorts of other words, logistics, right? Lots of words that are very positive in our culture, right? Uh, logic comes from the word logos. Logos and muthos for the Greeks both meant something akin to a story for the ancient Greeks of Homer and Hesiod. Now, dating Homer is uh, a very, very difficult thing to do. I mean, not to romantically date him, but <laughs> to, to uh, place a time period for Homer. I mean, he might have been a perfectly fine guy to get along with. Um, but uh, we could say maybe some at least 3,000 years ago, probably more, so at least 1,000 years BCE. Um, but then in the 5th century uh, BCE, we have the rise of what today we would call history. And history begins with the great Thucydides and his sort of pupil Herodotus. And these two started what we would call the field, the discipline of history, by saying, okay, we got all these stories. Let's see which of these stories, right, logos or muthos, we can verify. And so Thucydides and Herodotus go out and they try to find people who can say, yeah, I was there when that battle took place, and I saw those things happen. Or maybe second best would be, yeah, my father or my mother was there when that battle took place, and yes, she told me about this. So for Herodotus and Thucydides, these became more reliable stories. And they applied the term logos 
to the more reliable story. And what do we mean by more reliable? Stories that could be verified, right? And this is with us today, right? The Boston Globe and the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, right? We hope that if they write a story, they're going to have fact checkers, right? That's what Herodotus and Thucydides were doing. They were fact checking the story. So that's still with us today. What else did Herodotus and Thucydides do? They said the stuff that we can't verify, that we're going to call muthos. That is a myth. So now we begin to have this separation between the verifiable story, logos, and the story that can't be verified, the muthos, the myth. And that has come down to us today, especially as we go through the Enlightenment, as we go through the age of reason and rationality, and we begin as quote-unquote enlightened Westerners to disregard, disvalue the myth. A myth is just a story that's false. Whereas what we want is the truth. We want the fact. We want the thing that's verifiable. But not everything in our universe is verifiable. Now you might be wondering, what's not verifiable? Well, let's think about it for a moment. If I came in here and I said, huh, I found this book in the Gleason Library. It's called Moby Dick. And I read it cover to cover. How many of you have read Moby Dick cover to cover? OK. See, that's why I like coming here. It warms my heart. I found this book called Moby Dick. I read it cover to cover. There's a lot of truth in it. If I said that, right, and you wanted to verify it, would the best way to verify it be to go to Boston Harbor and get a boat and go out searching for the white whale? You laugh because that's completely absurd, right? The story that's in Moby Dick is not verifiable the way the story that you might read on the front page of the Boston Globe is. So why are we still reading Moby Dick? Supposedly, yesterday's Boston Globe is not going to be read as news 100 years from now, right? In fact, it's not even going to be read today. <laughs> but we're still reading Moby Dick, right? Why would we be doing that? Why would somebody say there's a lot of truth in Moby Dick? Well, let's think about it for a second. Our modern age deals with what I call, and others call, the correspondence theory of truth. This is a philosophical term, right? It comes from logic, and it's, it's very uh, common. And it sounds very you know, highfalutin, but it's really not. The correspondence theory of truth simply means if I say a statement, that statement can either be true or false. And if I want to find out if it's true or false, if I want to test its, uh, its truth value, then I go and I check the fact that it's speaking about. So if I say, that at 1.50 p.m. on October 30th in Carlisle, Massachusetts, it is sunny and 85 degrees outside, <laughs> we can check the veracity of that statement by looking outside, <laughs> right? going outside, feeling the temperature. 
That is called the correspondence theory of truth. If the fact corresponds to the statement, it's true. If the fact does not correspond, it's false. Seems real simple, right? Leave it to the logicians to make it complex, but that's really what it means. But there are certain things about which there's no external fact with which to correspond to a statement. Now, what sort of things do not exist externally, yet we can still make meaningful statements about them? Well, let's think about that for a minute. How many of you have seen love? <laughs> Let me ask a different question. And this question is very telling. How many of you, by a show of hands, believe that love exists? Raise your hand. It's always two or three who don't. <laughs> So you three, this doesn't apply to you, but everybody else, if you believe that love exists, right, then show it to me. Where is it? Does it exist over there in the middle of the street? Or does it exist on the first level of the library? Or only here on the third level? <laughs> right? If I say my love is a red, red rose. What am I saying? Where is love? Oh, one it's hand. It's in the eyes. What's that? It's in the eyes. Oh, it's in the eyes. So only ophthalmologists can see it. <laughs> only the blind can see it. What? Only the blind. Can't see it. Only the blind can see it. That is very Oedipal, right? The, the great character of Tiresias who could see, but he was blind. Um, well, let's think about that for a moment, right? Love is something real. Many of you, almost all of you, were willing to agree to that. Love exists. But we can't see it. We can't put it under a microscope. We can't grab it from wherever it is and hold on to it. And so we struggle to even speak about it. So when I say my love is a red, red rose, that does not mean that if I'm going to introduce you to my romantic partner, that when you go to shake her hand, you're going to be pricked with a thorn. <laughs> when I say my love is a red, red rose, I'm saying something about love that a computer would say does not compute. Right? I'm expressing something about the rose and something about my love that are radically different, but somehow in the minds of the human being, we can understand. Because there is no fact in the external world that corresponds to love. Because love is something that is internal. It's something internal. And so when we try to speak about love, we are either reduced to the babblings of little babies, right? When you're with your beloved and you say, oh, no, 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 right? <laughs> you are trying to communicate something that is inexpressible, ineffable, right? Or if we're really lucky, maybe we, instead of being reduced to the babblings of babies, we are elevated to the poetry of Shakespeare, right? But what is poetry? Poetry is speaking about something for which there is no fact in the world, for which there's no language that adequately approaches it. And so we are 
struggling to speak about it, and in order to speak about it, we utilize these things called metaphor and simile. Right? My love is a red, red rose is a metaphor. And it's not to be taken literally. Because if you take it literally, it either means that I work in a greenhouse, <laughs> or it makes no sense. So this is the beginning of myth. Myth begins with metaphor. A speaking about something which is a fact, not in the world, but in the human heart. It's speaking about something that can't be verified externally, but which endures through the millennia. Something that is not a thing, an object, but something that is very subjective and exists, if it exists anywhere at all, in the soul. That's the beginning of myth. Now, this course is called Myth and Religion. So if you're following along with me this far, then we can see how we can go from a metaphor about love to perhaps a novel like Moby Dick, which is still read because it contains many truths, not that are externally verifiable, but truths about the human condition, right? To speech and imagery about God, about the divine. Now, one of the great objections to this would be, perhaps, that, at least a very 21st century Western objection might be, that unlike love, which I think many of you might uh, buy into, talk about God, some of you, many of you, may say, is nonsense. Because, though you might not be willing to say love does not exist, some of you might say God does not exist. And so, de facto, any speech about God is going to be either false or nonsense. Because now you're speaking about something that does not exist. And you might as well be talking about unicorns or griffins or about any other fantastical creature because God doesn't exist. That would be a very modern objection to this. Yet, the Bible is still read. And there still are myths that we are constantly referring to and literally buying into. Think about it for a moment. What does it say on our currency? In God we trust. In God we trust. Because why? Why would it say that? Why would it say that? What is our currency? It's what? Our protector and our shield. <laughs> our protector and our shield. <laughs> oh, think about it. I'm being literal. What is our currency? Paper. It's paper. <laughs> right? Yes. What is that paper worth? Somebody over here said promise, which I thought was pretty good. <laughs> it's a promise. It's a promise. Uh-huh. <laughs> the paper literally, intrinsically, is worth nothing. almost nothing. 
right? The paper is worth almost nothing. And so we have to find a way of getting people to buy into the quote-unquote value of it. There was an interesting story, you can go and look this up, about a guy named Boggs, B-O-G-G-S. He's an artist. Oh, yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> and one of the things that he did for his artwork was he created Boggs Bucks. And these were pieces of art that were in no way meant to resemble American currency. But he would go around the country paying for things with Boggs Bucks. And there's a lot of you know, ins and outs to this story, but basically because he was an artist, and these were his artistic creations, for some people, they were worth getting in exchange for goods. So he'd go around, he'd pay for his groceries with two Boggs bucks. And then he'd go and he'd, you know, maybe pay for some gas with a Boggs buck. And people gave him the goods for the Boggs bucks. He eventually, got arrested by the FBI. <laughs> I'm not making this up. He got arrested by the FBI because this was a threat to the United States currency. It's not forgery. He wasn't trying to play it off as if it, this, you know, trying to deceive somebody into believing that the Boggs Buck was a dollar. But he got arrested for this. Because, as I started to say at the beginning, a myth is something that's all around you. It's like water for fish. You're just not aware that it's there. And on our currency, it says, in God we trust. Because we need to have something, something you might say metaphysical, that backs up this otherwise worthless stuff. Right? And now it's getting even more complex, right? Because, you know, it, it's bad enough that you, you go to your bank account online and it's just, you know, zeros and ones and, well, in my case, a lot of zeros. But, um, you know, you, you look there and it's just, it's digital, right? There's no gold backing it up. But now they have cryptocurrency. What the heck is that? We don't even know. You don't even know. And so we're already literally buying into certain myths. But I get ahead of myself. Let's get back to talking about religion and God and myth. The notion that God, whatever is meant by that, whatever is meant by it for you, whatever is meant by it for me, whatever is meant by it for others. The notion that God is expressed through myth is not heretical. It's not something that should be a, an affront to organized religions. Every great religion is sophisticated enough to be aware of this. And so, if we go back, for instance, to Hinduism and the early stories that are found before the Upanishads. The Upanishads are rather late in the Hindu tradition and they, are, they go back to sometime around 200, 300 BCE, and they're very philosophical. We're going to return to talking about the Upanishads in a minute. But before them, there were the Vedas. And the Vedas tell stories of gods that are fantastical. Gods with 130 heads. Gods with 800 arms. 
right? God's doing incredible feats, living for long, long periods of time, if not forever. And one of my other favorite uh, thinkers about myth, Alan Watts, has a very interesting way of interpreting this. He says, in those Vedas, the gods are portrayed in such fantastical terms, almost in order to, if they had neon lights, to light up in neon, don't believe this. <laughs> this is not the literal truth. This is a metaphor, right? So those Vedas are communicating to us in ways that are beyond the realm of belief on purpose in order that we don't take those stories as literal fact. Let's go to a different religion. In Buddhism, which grew out of Hinduism, there's a great story about, it could be about religion, could be about myth, it could be about ritual and practice, it could be about a lot of different things. It doesn't explicitly get to it. But here's the story. The story goes, if you are on one shore, and on that shore there's lions and tigers and bears, and there's forest fires, and there's all sorts of danger, and you look across this rushing river, and you can see across this very wide rushing river, on the other side there is a tranquil shore that is not on fire and doesn't have any of these dangerous beasts on it. And you want to get to the other side, what would you do? The story says you would make a raft. And you would get on the raft, sail across to the other side, and then once you get on the tranquil side, what would you do with the raft? The Buddha asks, would you put it on your back and walk around with it? <laughs> no, of course not. You would leave it there. And so the Buddha is using a metaphor, or what we might call a parable. Right? A parable is where there are symbolic images that stand in for something else. It's not quite an allegory. In an allegory, supposedly every single aspect of the story stands in for something else. In a parable, parts of it stand in for something else. In this parable, the dangerous shore is what's called samsara. That is our everyday mode of existence. The tranquil shore is nirvana, some, something or other, some sort of peace. Right? And the rushing river is the difficulty of getting from here to there. The raft could be understood as the religion. And part of that religion includes myths, stories. Right? So you hop on the raft, you use that raft as a tool to get to the other side. Once you get there, you don't carry the raft with you. You let it go. And so these, according to Buddhism, if we take that seriously, these myths are helpful. They're helpful tools, ways for us to possibly figure out how to get from samsara to nirvana. I want you to remember that story, because I'm going to come back to it next week. I'll remind you of it. But we're going to come back to that story next week. Let's shift to a different religion. In Judaism, in a seminal text that was written in the, I believe it was in the 1200s, by one of the greats uh, of modern Judaism, actually, Moses Maimonides, the book is called The Guide to the Perplexed. And it's, it was actually a correspondence course 
Maimonides was living in northern Africa. He was a physician, very, very accomplished physician, also a scholar. And people in Europe had heard about him. His fame had, had spread. And so he wrote letters to people to let them know how to properly read the Bible. And so it's basically, you know, one of our oldest accounts of a correspondence course. And in the introduction to it, he quotes from Proverbs a sentence that says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a vessel of silver. He quotes this, apples of gold in a vessel of silver. He goes on to use this in order to explain how the Bible works. He says that it's like if you had a golden apple and you covered it over with a filament of silver. In other words, imagine a piece of lace that is made out of silver. That is, it's not a complete uh, solid covering, like a napkin might be. It has little small holes through it. From a distance, this might look like a silver apple. But if you get up close, you see that it's only a silver covering, but the apple itself is gold. This is what Maimonides says is to be used as the guide to reading the Bible. The silver is the literal meaning of the text. From afar, or a cursory reading of the text, would give you this literal story, that the world was created in seven days, that it began with Adam and Eve, that Eve ate from the apple, etc., etc., that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and Noah built an ark, and all these other things. That would be the literal meaning. But M Moses Maimonides says, that leaves out the gold. And the gold is what he calls the metaphoric meaning. He says, we're not to believe the Bible on a literal level. The Bible is metaphor. So this is part and parcel of the Jewish tradition of how to read the Bible as metaphor. Let's switch our religions one more, once more, and let's go to what is the Gospel of Thomas. How many of you last Sunday read from the Gospel of Thomas? One? <laughs> what church are you going to? <laughs> the reason why I asked that question is because you won't be reading from the Gospel of Thomas in any church that I know of. <laughs> because we're familiar with four Gospels, Luke, Mark, Matthew, and John. And you can look through any Bible in the church, you're not going to find the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is what's called apocryphal. It wasn't included in the canonical or authorized writings of the church. And only recently, in the last century, was it translated into English. And so I give you a translation. It's a very short gospel. You could probably read it in a half hour. But it's extremely powerful. It comes from the same time as Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Um, and this is from the third uh, saying in the Gospel of Thomas. It says, Jesus said, quote, If your leaders say to you, Look, the Father's kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will get there first. <laughs> if they say to you, It is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is within you, and it is outside you. When you know yourselves 
then you will be known, and you will understand that you are children of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you live in poverty, and you are the poverty. What is Jesus saying there? First of all, I want to point out that in this gospel, unlike in Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, Jesus has a sense of humor. Right? <laughs> I love stand-up Jesus. <laughs> right? If they say heaven is in the sky, then the birds get there first. If it's in the sea, then the fish get there first. And we just can't have that, right? But what is he saying? He's saying that this notion of a, the Father's kingdom is a metaphor. It's not a fact. It's not in the external world. Don't use the correspondence theory of truth to get heaven. Right? If it exists, where does it exist? It exists within you. And if it's within you, right, if you quote unquote know yourselves, then it's everywhere about you. Another powerful quote from this gospel is, the kingdom of heaven is everywhere around us, but people see it not. Right? Because they're looking outside rather than inside. And that's where we started talking about myth. Myth is not something that corresponds to something in the external world. It has to correspond to your psyche, your soul. And that's what Jesus says here. That if you want to find the kingdom of heaven, look within. Know yourself. And then you will be transformed such that you will find it everywhere outside as well. So four different religions, four different approaches to reading text, religious text, not literally, but as metaphor as having meaning that is not an external truth, but an internal truth. Having meaning that persists through the ages because human nature persists through the ages. And these stories connect with something deep-seated in us. So where does that leave us in terms of God? Right? It's a question that almost shouldn't be asked. Because when I say that word God, that word is as meaningful as anybody who hears it. Right? Each person who hears it has their own meaning. And for us to try to ascribe to that word a meaning is what Joseph Campbell would call presumptuous. It's presumptuous. Right? That this is a symbol. It's literally a symbol because it is a word. Words are symbols. And we pour into this symbol our own personal meaning. For an atheist, that means the word God is a bunch of nonsense. For some devout believers, the word God might mean a personal God who knows that person's name and cares about that person and loves that person. For others, God might mean something ineffable and transcendent. But the point is that whatever it means to you, you are investing meaning in that word rather than perhaps allowing that word to express itself in some other way. You might be the one confining the word to a certain definition rather than allowing the word to mean something for you. So we've touched on a lot of different topics about religion and myth. Um, I have a lot more to talk about next week. Next week, we're going to look at some specific 
myths uh, from a number of different religious traditions. And when I say myth, hopefully we all are now understanding that in a more rich way. Uh, but I wanted to leave some time at the end for today for any questions that you might have. In the back. Could Shakespeare have been aware of Thomas? Or is the need to know thyself innately human in all of this period? Mm, great question. The question is, just in case you didn't hear, would Shakespeare be aware of the Gospel of Thomas? Or is the notion of know thyself something that uh, is not uh, specific to, uh, to Thomas? Um, Shakespeare probably didn't know the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas, I believe, was unearthed uh, in the late 1800s or early 1900s um, from a, a, uh, a site in Egypt. Um, but the Gospel of Thomas, it looks like, is very heavily influenced by what were known as the Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, uh, the Gnostics, coming from the Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, from which we get the word actually to know. The Gnostics were an early Christian sect, so there's some debate about that, but around at the same time, and they preached that the way to salvation was through self-knowledge. Remember that next week. I might have time to come back to it, so we'll, we'll see how we do. But the Gnostics taught that, and they also were heavily influenced, I heard somebody say it over here, by Plato and Socrates and the Greeks. And at the Temple of Apollo, the injunction was, know thyself. Right? And Socrates took that very seriously. So uh, Shakespeare was probably familiar with that general classical tradition. Yes? Where does emotional intelligence fit into this scheme of things? Hmm. Where does emotional intelligence fit into this scheme? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. If you... <laughs> I'm, I'm using my non-emotional intelligence, um, but I'll try to answer it. And if I don't, feel free to ask a follow-up. Um, myth can do two things. Uh, Joseph Campbell talks about the right-hand path and the left-hand path. One of the things that myth can do is it can give the society a shape. It can give certain norms. It can be prescriptive about how you should be in society. And so in that sense, it can be very helpful, very formative in sort of emotional intelligence, in creating empathy and care and compassion for one another. Right? Um, one of my favorite lines from Shakespeare is in Hamlet where Hamlet watches the players who are going to perform for the king and queen. He watches them perform a play about Hecuba, a tragedy. And Hamlet finds himself crying. And Hamlet says, what is Hecuba to me or me to Hecuba that I should cry for her? In other words, this is all just a phantasm, just a, a an illusion, yet we feel very strongly about it. And one of the things that myth does, it brings out empathy, care, compassion. That would be the right-handed. Right? It also might you know, emphasize, such as in Hinduism, it might solidify and emphasize the role that you're supposed to play in society. Right? Maybe you're supposed to be a Brahmin, or you're supposed to be a, uh, a, uh, a, a gardener or, or a warrior, and it emphasizes that you should play that role. The left-handed path is the path where myth 
calls you on your journey, calls you to disregard the expectations and the confines that society places upon you, and calls you to your own personal journey, the call to adventure, whereby you might have to say no to the expectations of society. And some people would say, maybe that's more emotionally intelligent or maybe less emotionally intelligent, depending on what your perspective is. But that is the left-handed path that myth can call you on. Did I answer your question in any way? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> any other easy questions? Yes. Um, there was a story today that Joe Biden couldn't get communion because he believed in a woman's right to choose. And I listen to everything you're saying, and I think what you're saying is that if you read the scripture, whatever the scripture might be, what's important isn't what it says, what's important is what it means. And yet, what it says is often clear, what it means is whatever you want it to mean, you can pick and choose. So where does all of this leave religion and dogma and justification of all of that? It's a good question. <laughs> I wasn't sure I had one. No, 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 it's a good question. I mean, so in Judaism, for instance, with the Torah, there's an expression that says, turn it, turn it, you will find everything in it, right? In other words, the Jewish mystics would not only read the black lettering on the white background, they would try to read the white lettering, you know, the, the negative space, or they'd turn it upside down and read it that way. Or, as you might know, in Hebrew, each letter corresponds to a number, and so there's gematria, the uh, science, if you will, of reading the Hebrew Bible through its mathematical components and all sorts of different things. But the point is that we can read these myths in many, many different ways. But there may be better ways of reading it and worse. And how one reads it, uh, what I would suggest is, uh, depends upon how vitally that interpretation uh, inspires you. Myths are meant to be a call to life and to living. And if that myth inspires you to, uh, to live most vitally, you know, maybe that's the, that's the answer. I don't know. I don't know. Yes? You know, in answer to Bonnie's question, isn't it essential to have emotional intelligence in order to make myths mean anything? I mean, if you just look at something from the point of view of facts, yeah, it's not going to mean much to you. You have to have a degree of, of emotional intelligence involved before it means anything to you. Uh, yes and no. I'm going to go a little bit far afield. Um, there's a psychologist who actually teaches at the Harvard Ed School named Robert Keegan. Okay, Robert Keegan teaches uh, uh, developmental psychology. He was a student of Piaget. And he looks at, instead of looking at the development of children and their psychological uh, evolution, he looks at adults. And he finds that adults can fit somewhere on a spectrum between what he calls first order mental complexity and fifth order mental complexity. And this sort of tracks with emotional intelligence. Uh, there's components that are both about sort of facts and about um, relationships. And uh, my good friend Joseph Draper 
uh, did his uh, dissertation on the communication between Paul and uh, the Corinthians. Okay, and in those letters, what he argues is Paul is arguing for a what what is called a third order of mental complexity. This is where you care about the relationships. Right? Paul speaks about the relationship between human beings and God, and the relationship between different people. And that, in a certain sense, what sin is for Paul is uh, the violation of that relationship. And he's talking to the Corinthians, who Joe argues is second order. All they understand is rules and punishments and rewards, concrete thinking, right? So Paul is talking to them, talking about, no, what I'm saying is the relationship matters, and they keep on writing to him saying, so what do we do? <laughs> Tell us what to do. Give me, give me a practical, you know, every single day when I can, you know, do I get married or do I not get married? And, you know, all these questions. And they're sort of talking past each other. And you could see that if you're at this second order of mental complexity, you're going to read the Bible very literally, right? That there is a heaven, and there is a hell, et cetera, et cetera. But if you are at third order or fourth order mental complexity, you're going to read it on a metaphorical level. So it depends on where you are. There's a great, um, great story from India. In Hinduism, they have a practice of revealing the God, right? There's statues of gods. They're in a little uh, sort of altar, but they're covered by a, a drapery. And at the religious festival, the drape is dramatically pulled back, and everybody sees the God. And the saying is that each person gets from the God what he or she is ready to receive. Right? So we each receive only that which we're ready for. We can't receive something beyond our capabilities. Right? There might be something that happens that knocks us up a level, but we can only receive that which we're ready for. Questions? Right here. Um, how can you weave the collective unconscious? How can I weave the collective unconscious into this? Um, I, hand, I gave a handout uh, at the beginning that I didn't even talk about. Didn't get there. Uh, but basically, what Campbell speaks about in terms of archetypes, uh, he is drawing on both Freud and Jung and those archetypes are, at least in part, uh, based upon what Jung would call the collective unconscious. Right? Joseph Campbell says, it's crazy. If you go to uh, indigenous tribes of North America and hear their stories, their myths, and you go to indigenous tribes in Australia, and hear their stories and their myths, they can be nearly identical if you look through the specifics of those you know, cases. If you look through the, the uh, culturally uh, you know, specific items of it, they can be nearly identical. There is no way that there was, in any recent time, any sort of cultural mingling. And so Joseph Campbell says, how can we explain it? He looks to Jung, this collective unconscious. He has uh, a great example. Um, I never tried it out, uh, but he has an example that he uses at the beginning of one of his books. He says, newly hatched chickens. If you fly something that looks like a hawk over them, like it could be made out of paper, and it casts a shadow on them, they will scatter. right? There's something that's been passed down genetically that causes them to, they don't have the experience of a hawk 
eating one of their brothers or sisters in order to know to scatter, there's something that has been passed down genetically. Again, I don't know if it's true, I never tried it out. <laughs> Might just be a myth. Um, <laughs> but he suggests that for human beings, there may be this, this, this collective uh, knowledge deep in our amygdala or something where these archetypes are held. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes? Um, there was a question about dogma. I, I was thinking, it seems to me that dogma is perhaps an attempt to address what you mentioned as the second level that the Corinthians were at, the people who need rules. Uh, so there's a group of people who provide the rules. Uh, and maybe on one level that's a good thing, but I also feel that perhaps it's developed into a something darker where the people who made the rules then power. have a control um, over the people who follow those. So it has to do with power dynamic. Yeah. So the comment is that perhaps dogma has to do with the notion that um, Robert Keegan speaks about, about second order, that there needs to be rules. Uh, but that it could have a dark side to it, which is power and control. And that's certainly, certainly true. Yeah. Other questions, comments? All right. I will see you in one week. Have a happy Halloween. Thank you very much for coming out today.